Today on Public Eye News, a 65-year-old Houghton County cold case has been solved with the help of genealogy, and later, one arrest has been made in the fatal shooting at Tedeschi University in Georgia. Our Andy Jordan has a look into the wet weather around the UP, and later, a weekend sports recap you definitely don't want to miss. I'm Reed Hall. And I'm Bianca Kroll, and this is Public Eye News. A 65-year-old cold case opens back up as genealogy solves the case. On October 4, 1959, a human skeleton was found off of Davis Road in the city of Mount Queen. At the time of the discovery, the victim was estimated to be a child between the ages of 6 to 8. The investigation was conducted by the Mount Queen Police Department at the time. Recently, investigators in the Houghton County and the Michigan Sheriff's Department were investigating the already closed case of Marcus Zachala. The child was adopted by William and Halja Zachala from Goodwill Farm. When relocating from Houghton to Chicago, the couple was not able to explain the disappearance of the adopted child to family. The adoptive parents were later interviewed about his disappearance and admitted to throwing the child's body in a ditch due to his illness, claiming the child was sick for days before the couple found him dead in his room. No charges were pressed at the time due to the lack of evidence from the prosecution. In September of 2024, the case was reopened after genealogical testing proved the remains belonged to Chester Alfred Brini, who was adopted by the Zuchalas from Goodwill Farm and later renamed to Marku. Evidence shows the child suffered from severe neglect, beatings, and a fracture on his left rib. Chester passed away of child abuse and will now call Port Washington as his home to rest. No charges will be pressed as all guilty parties have passed away. And a new kids' gym is opening up in Escanaba, Michigan. This gym is a family-owned location by Cameron Hutu daughters, Christy and Kaylee. In 2020, they welcomed Apollo to the family and was born with a fragile X mutation that was inherited genetically. During this time, the family realized how much they needed to help Apollo and came up with We Rock the Spectrum Up North. This gym helps to enhance kids' abilities to help them to learn and thrive in the community. Included at the gym are suspended equipment with swings to help with balance, indoor play structure, sensory toys, calming room, and a private room for birthday parties with classes. Northern Michigan University's art and design professor Steve Hughes has received notable accolades for his boldly colorful acrylic paintings. He was selected as a monthly winner in the figure and portrait category of the 14th annual Plein Air Salon Art Competition. Hughes will now compete for a $15,000 grand prize and a chance to have his artwork featured on the cover of Plein Air magazine in May. The piece receiving recognition is his work Tourmaline, a painting that blends portraiture with graphic elements and patterns. Hughes' portraits begin with photographs of his models, where he then incorporates technology like Adobe Illustrator to create wallpaper type print patterns. The elements are layered at various transparency levels before he paints the resulting mock-up. And the Mackinac Bridge Authority has approved changes to the Mac Pass. This includes the lowering of initial Mac Pass deposits from $80 to $40 and refill deposits from $50 to $20. These changes are expected to start December 1st. The authority also voted to discontinue the acceptance of American Express credit cards and approved a 2.3% convenience fee on credit and debit cards to combat rising transaction costs. The new fee will add roughly nine cents to the typical $4 toll and will take effect January 1st of 2025. And in Michigan, some students have begun receiving similar racist text messages to those seen both in Michigan and around the country. CBS News Detroit reporter Jack Springate has more information on the texts and what investigators are doing about them. Well, we've now seen several incidences of these racist text messages targeting people of color across the country in the days following the 2024 presidential election. These horrendous texts have not only made their way to black voters here in Michigan, but now they're also reaching our students. At least five Farmington Hills students were subject to a version of these hateful and unsolicited messages. The Farmington Hills School District is responding, telling parents, quote, we are working to connect with the students impacted by this event and provide support. It is important to state that these types of racist comments do not reflect our school community nor our district values. This type of behavior is not tolerated here, end quote. Lake Orion also standing up for their students who receive these messages saying, quote, our district prides itself on its diverse, inclusive community where all students and staff feel they're a part of the Dragon Thunder. We strongly condemn any racially motivated language and refuse to allow it within our community, end quote. These students are the latest to be targeted by these messages based on the color of their skin as others across the country share their reactions. It just really shows like 
we thought we came far from where we were hundreds of years ago, but honestly, we have not at all, clearly. Cybersecurity expert David Derajotis says it's not difficult for whoever is behind this to obtain lists broken down by phone number and demographics, including race. He says these texts are harder to trace because they're likely coming from a third party text service, not personal devices. My opinion is that it is tied back to some type of list that was accumulated by some people, some person. We don't even know who's behind it right now, but we know simply that they're cowards, they're hateful. An investigation by the Louisiana Bureau of Investigation traced some of these messages back to a VPN in Poland as they continue to search for the original source. And for those of you who are interested in seeing the full communication sent to parents by Farmington Hills and Lake Orion School Districts, we'll have those full statements in this story on our website. For now reporting in Farmington, I'm Jack Springate, CBS News, Detroit. Now don't touch that dial. We'll be back with your weather and national news after this break. Welcome back. I'm Andy Jordan, and I'll be taking you through our public eye weather report. Taking a look at our roof cam here, you can see the gales of November are in full effect, and we have a wind advisory for the counties of Luce, Alger, and Marquette. Taking a look across the UP, heavy cloud coverage all around. Uh, in Houghton, it is 39 degrees, in Ironwood, 38, Iron Mountain, 39 degrees, Menominee, 42. And taking a look at the east side of the map here, in Escanaba, it is 41 degrees. In Manistique, 41. Sault Ste. Marie, 40. And back here in Marquette, it is 40 degrees and rainy. Taking a look at our current conditions, heavy winds coming from the north-northwest at 29 miles per hour with a barometric pressure at 29.95 inches and rising. And looking to tonight, uh, cloudy conditions, a low of 38. Winds coming out of the north at 10 miles per hour with a, our moon phase at a waxing gibbous. And looking to tomorrow, sunny skies, a high of 45, a low of 35, winds coming out of the south-southeast at 10 miles per hour. And looking at the rest of the week, again, clouds all across the board. On Wednesday, a high of 47, a low of 38. On Thursday, a high of 47, a low of 42. And on Friday, a high of 48 and a low of 41. That is all I have for your weather. Now back to the news desk. Thank you, Andy Jordan, for that weather update. It's looking pretty windy out there, so please be careful. Now moving into national news. On Sunday, Tedeschi University heard gunshots during the homecoming weekend. The Alabama law enforcement agency said that Waquez Mayrick, 27, was taken into custody after leaving campus during the shooting. He was found with a handgun and a machine gun conversion device. The agency said that Mayrick will face federal charges of possession of a machine gun. At this time, it is unknown if Mayrick was a student at the university. The 18-year-old student who passed away was not a member of the university. Twelve people were injured by the gunfire and four others have sustained injuries not related to the shots. The university canceled classes on Monday and are offering grief counselors for students on campus during this hard time. And the Wisconsin Supreme Court will have oral arguments today on whether the Civil War abortion ban will still be enforced. Abortion rights advocates stand a great chance at prevailing given the liberal justice in control. Wisconsin has passed the state's first prohibition on abortion in 1849, which stated that anyone who killed the fetus to save the mother's life was guilty of manslaughter. Democratic Attorney General Josh Call has, has filed a lawsuit challenging the law in 2022, as he argued that the law was before knowing a fetus can survive for 21 weeks of gestation. Planned Parenthood of Wisconsin filed a separate lawsuit asking the Supreme Court to rule directly on the constitutional right about the abortion ban. The court has agreed to talk about the case and will schedule oral arguments. The court's three conservative justices have accused the liberals of playing politics with the abortion laws. And wildfires are burning across thousands of acres in California and the East Coast. Fires in New Jersey are crossing the state line and shares with New York. Meanwhile, in California, communities just north of Los Angeles return to what is left from the destruction. CBS Jared Hill has more. In New Jersey, a wildfire of historic proportions. The flames scorching 3,000 acres. A record-setting drought turning the Garden State into fields of firewood. Not only is the fire burning on top of the ground, but it's burning under the ground. Up above, thick smoke is causing air quality concerns throughout the region, prompting some 
to leave. My neighbor said he saw some flames like by the side of the road and everything, so it's time to go. The fire, towing the line between New York and New Jersey, claimed the life of one of the thousands working to stop the flames. Authorities say a fallen tree killed 18-year-old Daryl Vasquez, a New York State Park employee. In Reading, Pennsylvania, helicopters fought the wildfires by air. Flames even overtook this park in Brooklyn, New York, causing smoky conditions miles away. On the other side of the country, progress in containing the mountain fire that's burned through more than 20,000 acres in Ventura County, northwest of Los Angeles. Hurricane force winds have helped send the flames jumping from neighborhood to neighborhood, turning homes into charred rubble. It's hard to see this. It's harder, I think, today for me than it was even a few days ago to wrap my head around the gravity of what has happened to our home. Jamie Randall, her husband and kids were among the thousands of people evacuated last week when the fire swept through their community. So many losing so much. My mother's uh, wedding band. But signs like this keep hope alive. Jared Hill, CBS News, New York. We'll be right back after this short break. Stay tuned. No world is truly unchanging. This is nature at its absolute finest. Our daughter. She's gone missing. I should leave this alone. But you won't. He's doing things no one had ever done before, and that is astounding. It's absolutely mind-boggling. Welcome back. I'm your host, Andy Jordan, and I'll be taking you through our Public Eye Sports Breakdown, where we'll be looking at all things Detroit. The Detroit Pistons hosted the Houston Rockets yesterday in a very close matchup. The Pistons were able to hold their ground for the first half, leading 45 to 43. After a rough third quarter, the Pistons managed to scrape their way back, trailing by two with just six seconds left on the clock. An intentionally missed free throw gave Detroit another scoring opportunity, but was squandered after a missed shot and two more missed free throws. The Pistons now find themselves 4-7 and seven and will host the Miami Heat on Tuesday. And keeping things at Little Caesars Arena, the New York Rangers took on the Red Wings on Saturday. Midway through the first period, the Rangers found themselves on a power play and scored just seven seconds into it. During the second period, the Red Wings offense made a move, peppering the Rangers net with 19 shots on goal, yet none of them hit the back of the net. New York stifled the Red Wings' momentum with two goals in under one minute towards the end of the second period. The Rangers managed to keep the Wings at zero goals, earning goalie Josh Jonathan, or Jonathan Quick his 61st career shutout. Quick has a shutout in 17 consecutive seasons for the sixth longest streak in NHL history. And the Detroit Lions traveled to Houston to face the Texans yesterday. Detroit's offense struggled in the first half of the game, putting up only seven points to Houston's 23. Lions quarterback Jared Goff threw three interceptions in the first half and two in the second, more than doubling his total of the season, having only four interceptions thrown until yesterday's game. The Lions' offense and defense showed up in the second half, preventing the Texans from scoring a single point while also scoring 19 of their own. Lions kicker Jake Bates tied it with five minutes left with a career-farthest 58-yard field goal, then another 52-yard buzzer beater to win the game. Now that is all I have for your sports. Back to the news desk. Thank you, Andy Jordan, for that sports update. How about those Lions? That was a huge game-winning field goal by Jake Bates. Did you happen to watch it yesterday? You know, I got to hear a lot about it from my mom. She was definitely cheering for them on, and I was pretty interested to hear that they were uh, struggling, but then they got it back together, so I'm pretty proud of them. Yeah, it was a pretty big comeback there in that second half. I definitely gave up a little bit of hope after, after going into halftime. That is all the time we have at Public Eye News. I'm Bianca Kroll. I'm Reed Hall. And we'll see you tomorrow. The preceding program was produced by WNMU-TV, Northern Michigan University Public Television, in studios located in Elizabeth and Edgar Hardin Hall.